Hello and welcome to the February 2021 virtual lecture of the Botanical Society of Scotland to be pre presented by Joanne Russell. I'm Julia Wilson, President of the Botanical Society. A few words first about the running of the meeting. Firstly, my thanks today to the Royal Botanic Gardens who are hosting this lecture on their system. And special thanks to Max Coleman, who's holding it all together for us as our producer. Now, you can ask any questions at questions at any time during this lecture by typing into the chat facility. And after Joanne has finished her lecture, I will pass them on to her. The last slide tonight shows our next lectures in this series, and you can also find details about them on our website and Facebook page. If you want to watch this lecture again or find some of our previous ones, you can find us on YouTube. Um, all our previous lectures of this series are now up there. And please click the subscribe button when you are there because um, we need 100 people to subscribe before we can get a sensible URL for the YouTube site. It doesn't cost you anything, just click subscribe. Now, Joanne Russell is our speaker tonight. She's a researcher in the Serial Genetics Group at the James Hutton Institute in Dundee. Her career began with a degree in agricultural botany at the University of Edinburgh, and she then went to Cornell University in the United States for six years. And then she returned to the UK for postgraduate study at the Scottish Crop Research Institute, which is now called the James Hutton Institute. Her PhD concentrated on developing molecular markers to measure diversity in the tropical tree Theobroma cacao. In other words, the cocoa tree, which of course supplies us with that essential nutrient chocolate. Her current work focuses on cereals, especially barley, and Joanne is going to tell us more about her work this evening. So over to Joanne now. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry about the technical hitches. Um, as Julia said, my name is Joanne Russell and um, I've got a, a very, very much most of my career in the last probably 20 years has been spent looking at genetic diversity and particularly um, looking at land races. And this, this first slide really highlights um, the importance of, of, in this case, barley land races, but it shows the different types of areas that barley grows in. The, the picture on um, is a picture on, uh, taken on Orkney, and this is me hand harvesting um, barley um, plots that we grew on Orkney. And this picture on the other side, it was a trip that we took to Ethiopia a few years ago to look at Ethiopian land races. And just behind the little boy, you can see the beginnings of the of the start of that crop. And this was in August um, in 2018. So you can see that the crop is just starting to begin. So this kind of really summarises the, the breadth and, and, and depth that we have available in these land races. If you think that they grow so well in Orkney, yet at the same time, these land races grow so well in Ethiopia. So I just wanted to explain the importance of barley. Um, I'm sure most of you are used to seeing barley grown in the fields around the Fife and the borders and the east, east of Scotland. But if you look at the, um, the map at the top, barley is the fourth most important in terms of production of the cereals. And you can see that um, the red colour highlights um, considerable production is the highest production. But you can see that most of the globally that barley is an extremely important crop. And the picture below from barley to bar, this was a picture. We were really surprised with this picture when we were, this was a picture that was taken when we arrived in um, Ethiopia at the airport. And it just kind of shows the importance of barley um, to a wide range of countries, not just um, you know um, developed countries, but also developing countries. And you can see that from those pictures that you can see people are using it for straw, they're using it for feed, and of course they're using it um, to develop um, a product, alcoholic products in the terms of beer in this case. The pictures along the bottom just give you an indication of the different types of products and the different types of places. If, if you have ever been in Ethiopia, you might have tried this, which is um, kolo, which is like um, um, a kind of roasted barley. 
and it's eaten as a snack with beer and um, it's actually really addictive. We brought loads of these packets of these back. We probably shouldn't have brought them all back, but we did. Um, and we, we spent quite a, a long time um, consuming those and also consuming, obviously, um, the, the whiskey as well. So I was just going to um, maybe take you back 10,000 years and, and just walk you through the history of barley. And um, history, uh, barley is an ancient crop. And like many of the cereals, it, it started its life in the Fertile Crescent. And this is an old map that was taken from a book by um, Harlan uh, written in the 60s. Um, and this is the classic picture of the Fertile Crescent. You can see it goes from Israel through Syria up into the um, Turkey and then round into Iraq and Iran. And um, the theory is that barley was first domesticated in this region. And if you look at the picture over here, you'll see this first picture shows a picture of wild barley. And you can see that the seeds are starting to dehiss from the, from the ear. And of course, this is a, a great dispersal trait. And um, wild barley's um, were grown and, dis and dispersed, they, they dispersed and were carried on the, um, most likely on, on animals' um, coats and fur and carried and then um, dropped and they would, uh, would germinate when the conditions were right. However, that's not particularly good when people are starting to settle in communities and they actually want to maintain, keep the grain on the ear so that they can harvest it for food and they can also harvest it for sowing the next year's crop. And there was two very simple mutations um, caused this what we call brittle rachis. And these mutations um, resulted in what we now see as um, barley. And this is one of the early domesticated barley types. And you can see that the grain is retained on the ear. But what's really fabulous about barley, and I hope by the end of the, this, um, this talk, you will be as enthusiastic about barley. And you may not look at the field you see um, in, in quite the same way. Um, Bar wild barley still grows um, in the Fertile Crescent. And these pictures at the bottom, um, the one in the middle gives you a good example of what the ear looks like um, when it's grown in a field. And you can see in the background that it doesn't grow just alone. It's, and this is in some of these meadows. Um, and these three pictures were taken on a trip to Israel a few years ago by one of my colleagues. Um, this is a famous cave where they found um, some dried grain that they could actually um, date and age to 6,000 years ago. And you can see in the foreground, uh, there's a lot of different um, plant material and wild barley is included. So we have a record of the history of what's what's happened over the last 10,000 years and before in these, these populations that still grow um, across the Fertile Crescent. But we also have um, a very good record of what happened following domestication. And following domestication, barley went in several different directions and followed the routes of the, the diff various different trading routes. And what happened was that these individual seeds would have, these, um, the, the retention on the ear would have, would have allowed people to travel with the grain, take the grain with them, start cultivation. And as the grain moved and people moved, the, the barley would, the land races would have become adapted to a wide range of different um, conditions. Because you can imagine that conditions in this region, and as it moved up into, um, we now see barley land races from Scandinavia and obviously from the UK down into um, southern part of Spain and of course along North Africa and into Ethiopia and then far east up into the Tibetan mountains in Nepal. And again, I've just tried to pull out some pictures um, of showing you different locations where we find land races. And again, these land races are still present in this form. So they've still got this, this genetic memory of, um, of, of how they've traveled and how they've become locally adapted to these conditions. This again over on the um, left hand side, as you look at it, is um, our, one of our fields on Orkney. So we have these very large collections of land races and it's an ancient and highly adaptive crop. And as you can see from the distribution and the expansion that's occurred worldwide, it's, un, it's important in all these very climatically vulnerable regions. And therefore we would expect that, that this material will be particularly valuable for looking at um, things like climate change and sustainability. Um, it's undergone these extensive uh, range expansions. and the Looking at the, the um, like many um, 
species. It has been stored in different gene banks. There have been large collections over the last 100 years, and we think there's roughly about 400,000 um, barley accessions stored, and about 80% of those barley accessions are land race accessions. So we have huge amounts of material that we can actually begin to use. And um, Harlan and Martini, which um, in the USDA Yearbook of Agriculture in 1936, wrote that, that, they, that these land races are the world's pri priceless reservoir germplasm. I think that's, that's a really nice way of summing up what we have in these collections and what we hold in our gene banks, that these, this is priceless, we'll never get these back again. And they're just such a wonderful um, reserve that we can actually start to use. And I also like quoting that because I think having the name Martini must be quite exciting. Um, I would have liked to maybe change my name to Martini. It would be quite cool. So we have these very large collections, um, 400,000 individuals, um, but we, we, as well as having these, these collections that we can start to look at and we can start to look for novel variation, we are, we've also had massive advances in technology. And um, this picture highlights um, our first attempt at um, sequencing the barley genome. And we started um, sequencing the barley genome probably in um, the, probably around about the middle of two, uh, probably about 2005, 2006. And um, this was a large collaborative project. Um, each of the main, um, main countries that work in barley research, and we're a relatively small international community. Um, the, the, we have a group in China, a group in Australia, the Americans, um, ourselves in Germany. Um, we all got together and we decided that we would sequence the barley genome and we would each take a different chromosome. So barley has seven chromosomes and our responsibility in the UK was to sequence chromosome 2H. Um, and so by the time um, we, we, see, we all sequenced these and we assembled the genome and the total number of base pairs in the barley genome is about five billion um, base pairs. So it's a very large genome. And fortunately, or unfortunately, you've, most people now know about sequencing. They've heard the words PCR and variants. So, you know, um, it's much more, it's much easier to explain to people what we've actually got. And about 1% of that sequence, um, these 5 billion base pairs, only 1% of it is, is gene, is actual genes. Is, and, and so, you know, it's, it's a very small portion of the genome. So you have to do a lot of sequencing in order to be able to identify those genes. So since 2012, the technology has, has, has rocketed and sequencing has become so much cheaper and so much better. We can now get much longer reads. We can assemble things much, much more easily. And so we published another iteration of the barley genome in 2017, and we just published the last one in 2000, in, actually in December last year. So, and we're still not quite there. We still have, we have better approximations of our genes. Um, we still um, have these large regions where there's no genes. And so it's still, it still is a very complex genome. But the good thing about barley is that it is a diploid and it is an inbreeder. So we do the genetics of, of barley are much simpler than that of, of wheat. And quite often barley is used as a model for wheat. So this is um, again, this is a slightly complex slide and you don't really have to worry about the detail. What I wanted to try and show was how we identify these variants from our DNA. So we, I've already um, said that we have all of these individuals that we have um, collected in gene banks. Um, we also have now the barley genome sequence, these five billion base pairs. But how do we start to understand what the variants look like in those individuals? So this, this diagram here, this is called a Sarkos diagram, and you'll see these in a lot of um, genetics papers, genomics um, sequencing papers. And what you see in this is it, it's just a really um, simple visual way of showing the seven chromosomes, in this case, um, one through the called H chromosomes after hordium. And what you see is each of these lines is, is represents um, the, the, the different variants, the different SNPs in the, the base pairs in the barley genome. And then the lines round about it are different individuals. And you can see that the, the wild barleys, the Hordium spontaneum, um, 
are the inner line and you can see that the lines are quite jaggy. So that means there's a lot. We're picking up a lot of variation. The, the, the bigger the, the depth of lines, the, the more variation. And you can see with different accessions that these lines change in their different sizes. So this just gives you an, a feel for how variable um, the barley genome is. And you can see, for example, on this chromosome here, this 6H. This one then. OK, so I've described the types of sequencing that we can do. And um, for example, so the the, either of these two will allow you to identify the variations in the genes that you're seeing. So either we, we can sequence the whole gene, and in which case we can sequence um, about 1% of the genome, about 60 million base pairs, or we can take a snapshot and we can actually see individual SNPs um, per gene. And this allows you to do multiple um, individuals across for example, 96 individuals or 384 individuals. So this is a much more, um, and it's also less expensive, and um, it's much more the, the, the approach that breeders like to use because it gives them a snapshot of the variation across the whole genome. So I'm going to talk about first about the, um, the main results that we've been looking at. And um, the first thing we did was um, we identified with our colleagues at the Gene Bank at IPK in Gattersleben in Germany, we identified a set, a range wide set of land races. So you can see from this slide that the blue dots is the georeference position of each of the land races that we surveyed. So you can see that we covered the land races from the Fertile Crescent as well as the red dots, which is the um, wild barleys from the Fertile Crescent. And the land races then go into um, across East Asia and they come up in through Europe and into Spain and then into um, North Africa. And what we did when we did this, we had about 137 um, land races and about 100 wild barleys, and we identified over 1.6 million SNPs. And of course, that's a huge number of variants that we're seeing across these individuals and across all of these genes. But what's really interesting, and, and the way in which we try to, to, to understand this variation is we need to break it down into smaller parts. And the most important part of a gene and the variant that causes the most um, most changes in the protein and the function of that gene is the, what we call the non synonymous um, changes. And you can see here that we, we detected a wide range of non synonymous changes and, and these can now um, these will alter the actual protein and therefore will change. So these are the most important ones for us to look at. But what we can do, rather than plot all of these individuals, we need to find some way of actually looking at the similarities between individuals. And so what we do is we, we take a pairwise comparison. So if you look, for example, on this figure, again, this is the same group of land races, each individual is represented by a different dot. And what we do is we look at this individual, this purple individual, and we look at his nearest neighbours and we see how many variants they've got in common with each other and how similar they are. And so if they're very similar to each other, we'll, we'll give them, a, we'll call them the same thing. We'll give them the same color. They'll belong to the same group. And so what this allows us to do, it allows us to break down these 1.6 million variants and it allows us to group and cluster individuals. And so what you can see um, here is that you see the very much you, you get this color cluster of colours. So for example, over into um, Spain and northern and uh, North Africa, you find that we see a predominance of this red type haplotype. Similarly, as you move, start to move through Europe, there's a, a dominance of a blue moving into a yellow. And then as we move into the Fertile Crescent, you'll see there's lots of different colours. And still within the Fertile Crescent, the land races in that region are still probably the most variable that we see. But we see this very much, um, the, the variation we detect is all, always shaped by um, geography. So it's a really interesting, I mean, it's what we would expect that if you if you are adapted to the same region, then you will share a lot of similar uh, similarities. So what else we can do with this data is we can look obviously uh, across the whole genome, but we can also start to look at individual genes. And this is where this type of technology, particularly exome capture, um, becomes really important. So this gene, this is HVPPDH1, and um, this is a really important gene because what it is, is it's a gene that controls your photo period. So it's a gene that has allowed individuals 
that originated in the Fertile Crescent to move northwards where the, length, the day length gets longer, um, where we have winter conditions. So it's a really, really important gene. So what you can do is you can look at this gene and this gene is made up of um, regions which control the proteins um, and these are called exons and you can see these as um, appearing as these blocks and each of the little arrows below it is a different variant. And you can see that some variants, these ones in grey, are in a region that it doesn't actually change the, the function of the, of the gene. So the gene will um, still function exactly the same way despite having these variations. And it's really, um, it's really an, similar to what they've been talking about with COVID when they sequence the COVID virus. When they sequence that and they find variants, some of the variants don't actually affect the, the action of the virus or the mode of transmission, whereas other variants and particularly variants which change the, the protein and the product of the gene will um, change the, the various aspects. So the same is, is true for any gene. And so you can see I've highlighted here some of the some of the um, variants which will make the protein do something different and will allow that change in adaptation towards different um, day lengths. And what I've done in the bottom here is I've plotted each of these variants. So we can look at these variants across this gene as a whole. And this gene is about 3000 base pairs. So it's only a small, tiny piece of the of the whole of the genome, but it's a very important gene. And you can see um, that again that you see some geographical structuring of your colors. Um, you see some variations. So the blue and the orange are different variants of this whole gene. And you can see that this is very different throughout the whole of the um, of our survey of our land races. So we can pick up considerable variation at the gene level, but we can also look for variation across the whole of the genome. So what's the practical aspects of that? That's all great that we can say, oh, this is very diverse. We've got all this variation that we see within these land races. But what can we actually do with that? And how do we begin to actually either, well, do two things. One is understand the genes that are involved in adaptation, but also begin to start to use that variation in modern breeding so that we can actually um, begin to develop um, lines and work with breeders for line um, to develop varieties that we can grow in different climates and maybe where um, the environment is less um, suitable for barley or where the land is maybe marginal, where the soil type isn't particularly great. Um, and so we can start to understand these these developments and start to begin to also first understand it, but also um, and importantly, we can develop populations that the breeders can use to in, to um, develop new varieties. So this is um, just an example here of what we've done. We've, we've identified across this whole region, we've pulled out individuals that are um, represent each of the different types of groups. And you can see here, this individual is an Ethiopian line, uh, which is coming from down here. And I've, I've color coded it green to be very, it's almost similar to the green here. And um, then we've chosen a line from uh, mainland Germany and we've taken an Iranian and a Tunisian line. Again, the orange lines around this region of North Africa, a line from Syria and a line from Iraq and one from Russia. And the best way to understand this variation is to actually begin is to to take that variation and put it into an elite line. So what we do is we generate a pop, what we call a population. And in this case, we have an elite line and this is a cultivar you'll see grown in most um, farmers fields across the UK and, and, and in um, mainland Europe as well as in Australia. This is called RGT Planet and this is one of the most recommended, uh, the highest recommended list varieties for malting. And what we've done is we've crossed it with each of these individuals and we've produced what we call an F1. And you can see that this F1 is half of the elite line and half of the, um, the land race. And we've done this for each of these. And then once we've done that, what we do is we've got two options. We can either self those um, to give another population and start to break up that variation so we can see the effects of it, or we can back cross it, which is what we've done in this case. So we've back crossed this um, hybrid to the F to the elite line and now we're starting to see smaller portions of the um, land race in a background of the elite. So this just allows us to take the whole genome and break it into smaller parts so that when we grow these we can actually see the effects of those smaller parts 
on what the phenotype that we're looking at. So doing this type of approach with these individual lines, we've generated a back cross population of about 637. And this is um, part of an EU funded project called Barista, which is funded through the SUS crop um, sustainable cropping program, um, which was um, and this 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 work started last October and we have partners across Europe and the plan is I'll just show you the figure. This is actually just hot off the press. We actually developed those populations with 637 lines and we sent them to our colleagues in Zaragoza. And um, this is a picture of Zaragoza um, on Monday. And this really shows our this each of these these rows is one of our lines grown out as a as a um a on a trial site. So you can see that all of the this is one individual. So there's 637 individuals in here, along with the parental material, and this material will be multiplied up um, this uh, this year in Zaragoza. And then what they will do is they will send seed to all of our locations on this project. And a, this little barley plant represents where we will try and trial all of this material. So we'll have a site here in Dundee. There'll also be a site even further north in Finland with our colleagues in um, in in Finland. Uh, we'll have sites in mainland Europe. We'll also have a site in Italy and then Zaragoza will also grow um, the material. And so what this will allow us to do, it'll allow us to um, understand all the different components that um, allow you to be adapted to a particular environment, but it also allow um, people to go out, scientists to go out, breeders to go out and look at this material and select individuals that are doing particularly well in under their conditions. So you can imagine that, you know, um, the Russian, maybe the influence of some of the, the Russian alleles from um, from that land race will do particularly well in in the in the northern um, sites up in Finland and in Scotland, but we don't know. So so this is the kind of um, almost the the um, the kind of test and the proof of the pudding is when you can actually not just genotype this material and understand the genetics, but you can actually put it in the, under field conditions and you can actually start to measure things that we would normally measure. Things like when they flower, whether they mature, whether they establish in the first place. Things like height, are they going to be too tall? Um, do they mature all at the same time? What can a grain, how does the grain look? How many tillers do they produce? And, and, and obviously things like yield is very, very important. So this is a project that's ongoing and um, we hope to continue with this. Um, we hope to get this material sown um, this time next year as part of our spring trials. So I want to really um, finish my talk, um, the last part of my talk really on something that probably um, is, is very close to home and I want to talk really about, um, I've talked about the, the overall diversity that you see across the wide range um, across across the global effects of land races. But what I wanted to do specifically was to look very, very locally. And in this case, we wanted to look locally in Northern European and we wanted to assemble a collection that was really based purely on the land races from the UK and in specifically Scotland and also the Nordic land races. So we're really looking as we've noticed that um, when we've when we've talked to breeders from places like Iceland and Greenland that they're actually now they used to grow barley in these locations um, just for straw. They never really expected to get any grain from these, but they're now finding that as the temperatures are changing, they're actually now starting to get product at the end of it. They're starting to get a decent yield. And so we really want to understand this local adaptation um, to the northern climes. And it's a really nice set of germplasm, which is very Scottish. Oh, sorry, wrong way. So I'm going to introduce um, the history of Scots bear and I've written here probably because when I did this talk originally, when I started working on Scots bear, we, we have very good collaborations with Carlsberg and I thought it would be funny to go, you know, the, the Carlsberg advert where they go is probably the best beer in the world. So I we don't really know whether this is true about Scots beer, but we probably think it is the oldest cereal variety commercially grown in Europe. 
And we actually think there is evidence to suggest that it's actually the oldest land race outside of the Fertile Crescent. So it's a really very valuable source of material. And I've got some quotes over the other side. If you look at the, the picture, the original picture of Bear or Big, as it's sometimes called, um, there is some, some evidence that it was around um, 600 to 1000 um, years AD. So there is the evidence to suggest that it has been around for a long time and particularly in, in this region of Scotland. What's really interesting about this, not just the fact that it's the oldest land race we know of, but it's also what we call, um, farmers would call a 90 day barley. So it grows really fast. So you can plant it quite late um, after the rain and the geese and, and various other things have disappeared and you can still get it harvested and out the ground pretty quickly. So we really want to understand what makes it, what allows it to do that. So from a, from a genetics perspective and understanding genes, we want to find out why does it flower so quickly and why does it produce its grain? Um, we, it's probably very well adapted to poor soils. And I'll give you an example of where we've tested this and how we've looked at this aspect. And um, there is some evidence, well, there is evidence that it came from the Vikings. And we always think that this sounds really great because it, it makes it sound really exotic that the Vikings rode across, um, you know, from over to Shetland and their, um, these, their narrow boats and what they brought with them was barley. And um, we like, we just like, we think that that's just such a nice story if it was true. <laughs> and um, it's really stood the test of time. And up until um, there's various, let me just show you some pictures. So, um, it started to decline probably in the late 18th, 19th century. And um, by, the 19, by 1912, they reckoned there was only about 4,000 hectares of bear grown in Scotland. So it did decline and it almost died out. And it was thanks to people um, like our colleagues who work at the um, University of Highlands and Islands at the Agronomy Institute, as well as people at SASA. There was a PhD student um, working at SASA who actually went round all of the islands from Shetland to Orkney down the Western Isles and collected material. And these are some of her pictures of the people she met and the, the fields of bare barley that she collected seed from. And you can see that the locations are absolutely stunning. Um, and so it's a great place to grow barley. How it survives in these areas, I have no idea because it's very exposed and it's very tall. So what we did was we started to assemble a collection. So we took the SASA lines that Cathy Southworth had, um, had identified. And this is an example on the right hand side. This is Scots bear. This is it's typically what we call a six row type. And you can see here that it's got three rows of um, grain and that's what we call a six row. Whereas the what you'll see growing in most of the fields um, and for most malting barleys are what we call a two row and this is an example on the other side of a two row and you can see oops and you can see how different they are um oh sorry it's jumping and what we were able to do was we were able to go back through our historical records and this is an example of our historical records um that were developed in the collected in the 1960s 70s um by call by people who used to uh, the the um in Julia's introduction, she said that I started to work at the Scottish Crop Research Institute, but even before the Scottish Crop Research Institute, uh, it, was, it was based at Pentland Field and it was called the Scottish Plant Breeding Station. And in those days, um, when we were allowed to do public breeding um, with public money, people would go and collect samples and they would, um, we, we actually had our own gene bank at that time. And the gene bank, um, when we moved to Dundee, uh, the gene bank was, all of the material was transferred down to um, the John Innes and is now part of the germ, um, germplasm collection down there. Um, but we still keep the same labels. So if you're ever in the John Innes collection, um, if, you look for, if you're looking for a barley variety, you'll see the letter B before it. And those were the ones that represented what came from what was the Scottish plant breeding station at the time. And so we kept very good details, handwritten details. And we went through these and we identified about 150 accessions, which represented the whole of the, the UK um, land race collection as well as um, of, of that about 40 different bears. So the first thing we did was we genotyped these material. We didn't use the exome, expensive exome capture. What we did was we used the chip array. 
And this diagram, um, the the part on the on this on the um, left hand side is color coded, and you can see that all of the blue lines on this side, each of the lines represents how different they are to each other. And so you can see here that most of the blue lines are quite similar to each other, but the branch lengths are reasonably long, so there is diversity in there. And as you move through the diagram, you start to see we, we start to get into the Scandinavians, which are pink coloured. So these are six row Scandinavian lines, old cultivars from um, Sweden, from Denmark. And, um, and you can see that they're sitting somewhere between our two row um, UK varieties, land races, and then the six row Scandinavian. And then the red ones, these ones here are all the bare lines. And again, you can see that the branch lengths are relatively short, so they're very similar to each other. It looks like they come from a single origin, but there is variation. And when you start to look at these, these individuals and you start to plot them, um, colour code them based on their, um, their diversity, you can see that we see very much um, distinction between the islands. So if you look here, you'll see that this is the Shetland Isles, and you can see that most of the individuals from the Shetland Isles are blue with a bit of integration in red from the Western Isles. Again, here is Orkney, and again, the Orkney individuals are mainly green coloured. So they're very, they're different, they're distinct, um, but yet very similar on an island basis. So we're seeing quite a bit of um, unique island different differentiation between the lines. So it's a really nice population that looks like, um, although they've originated from probably a single origin, they've been on the islands long enough to develop their own characteristics and become adapted to those particular conditions. So what we did was, um, with this collection, we really wanted to see how well this collection would do um, on Orkney. And we work quite closely because of the bears. We work closely with the um, with the University of Highland Islands and um, their the Agronomy Institute, which is located at Orkney College. I don't know if you can see this picture particularly well, but this is Orkney College and this is at, on Kirkwall. And this is our um, field, one of our field trials that we put in there that year. So we have a site on uh, Kirkwall, but we also have this site on Bury. Um, if you travel to Orkney on the ferry that arrives at St Margaret Hope, you'll go across into Bury and um, it's a spectacular location um, for a field trial. And this is what the site in Bury looks like. And the reason we were interested in this site is because the farmer um, at this on this who owns this land grows bear for Brucladi. So um, Brucladi Distillery um, st use bear in their in the whiskey, and they have done for the last ten years. And um, they these guys grow the bear specifically for the Brucladi distilling and uh, malting and distilling. But what's interesting about this piece of land, this Bury site, is that it's very much um, it's very uh, high pH. It's very alkaline soil, so it's it's very sandy, and so. Um, you know, we wanted to see how well adapted our land races were on this site. And this just shows um, an example of our field trials, um, which we measured for a wide range of traits. This is the Dundee location and this is our Orkney location. And um, this graph at the bottom just shows the difference between the bears and Scandinavian land races. They, they do flower very early, which means you can get them in the ground and out the ground before the, there's heavy rains. Um, if we're growing on the west coast, we ideally you need to get that the material out of the ground before um, before the rains in August. Um, whereas the two row and elite lines are much later and often don't mature. But what we did notice when we started, so the 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 main interesting part of growing the material in on the Bury site, which is the um, the alkaline soils, calciferous soils, is Maybe you can see this from this picture, but you can see the sandiness of the soil. It's very fine and it's very black. And so the first year we did this, we grew some of the, our elite lines and we grew the bears. And what we found was that the soil's very lacking in manganese. And so we found you got this effect of manganese deficiency on your plants. But what we observed was that the bears don't suffer um, from any manganese deficiencies, whereas the elite lines, this is one of our one of our elite lines, which will yield between six tons and eight tons of um, per hectare, actually yielded nothing. Um, we, ve we 
really didn't see any flowers grown on that. So what we thought would be a good idea was we would try looking at all of our recommended list lines. And this was a trial we sowed last year. And um, what you can see quite clearly is you can see the bears are very green. So these are the bears plots is taken from a drone. And you can see that um, Olympus is one of our highly recommended um, barley varieties. Laureate is also another one, um, Concerto. And um, this is RGT Planet, which is the variety that we've used across the large collection of land races, a global collection of land races. So what we decided to do was we decided we would try and get to grips with this um, tolerance, this why the bears are tolerant to manganese and how they how they can actually um, how this works. So what we did was we crossed the bear, Unst as it's called, with our KWS Irina. And so what we were looking for was looking for tolerance to deficient soils from the bear, early flowering and harvest, and some novel molting qualities. And with the elite lines, we were looking for high yield, good quality and uniformity. So this is just a little cartoon to show what we did. We crossed our Irina. These are our seven chromosomes with our Orkney bear, again, our seven chromosomes, and we produced what we call an F1. So this is a hybrid between the both. This time, instead of back crossing to the KWS Irina like we did in the previous one, we actually crossed, we did a self. And so what we end up after several rounds of selfing is we end up with this mosaic of a combination of the KWS Irina and the Orkney bear. And so what we took, we took these seeds, this gave us about 3000 seeds, and we took those and we sowed them on the tri a trial on Bury. And so this is each individual seed was hand sown. We developed this, this um, really high tech piece of equipment um, made from wood that um, basically gave us was a dibber with um, rows of 12. And we planted each individual seed. We labeled each individual seed and we phenotyped each individual plant. We also took DNA samples. So here's an example in the yellow box of um, a plant. And we took DNA, um, we measured manganese uh, efficiency three times throughout the season, and we took leaf samples for DNA extraction. We then went back and we harvested all of the material by hand. And um, we've got that, that's all now stored, um, ready to be used for the next phase of the experiment. So we then took the seed and we multi we kept on selfing and selfing until we got what we reckon was fixed, um, genotypically fixed material. And this is the trial that was sown last year in 2020. And um, we managed to get the material up there before lockdown. And um, our colleagues at the University of Highlands and Islands managed to get this plot sown. And what you can see here is you can see segregation across the whole of the field. You can see differences um, in colour and greenness. And this was measured. Um, if you look at the little um, diagram here, you'll see some that are very Irina like and some that are very bear like. So you can see the differences quite clearly. And some of these have got two rows, but they look like bears. Some have six rows and they, they're late and they're not doing particularly well. So we've really mixed up the genetics in this. And so we hope that this type of experiment will allow us not just to select individuals that are doing well under these conditions, but also to understand how these, these traits are, um, are important. So I just want to finish really on talking about um, just some, some kind of thoughts about where we are with this. So we, we've got unique combinations of diversity which are locally adapted. These resources that have been stored in gene banks are just amazing. And um, we've now got the ability to identify variation and variance at almost every gene in barley. And we've now started to develop these novel methods to, to really begin to understand um, some of the traits that we've never been able to get a handle on, adaptation to a changing environment, to different climates. And um, we've shown an example where we can where we can take some of these land races and we can grow them on marginal soils, yet they still outperform um, any of the other material without any inputs. So our, our kind of idea is that we really, you know, conservation via utilisation is really what we want to do. So we want to conserve all this material, but we want to use it and we want to get the benefits out of this material. And of course, barley, um, one of its main things is it makes great whiskey, makes great beer and of course makes great bannocks. So there's a lot of people involved in this um, work. 
I won't list them all, um, but our funding comes from um, RESAS from the Scottish Government, also um, European Union and recently um, from Suscrop Aeronet. And thank you very much. Oh, well, sorry, thank you. One. Sorry, that one. <laughs> thank you very much, Joanne. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry you struggled with um, the uh, technology a little bit. Um, I yeah, think a I lot of us are finding <laughs> a lot of us are finding things keep going down, and I'm sure the bad weather's got something to do with it. But it's very interesting talk, and there was lots of information in there that was new to me. And those photographs of the crop trials, you know, the, a picture is better than a thousand words. Um, just to remind the audience that questions and answers are open. Um, I'd just like to kick off with one. Um, I assume that, you know, the beers in all their uh, selection processes done by farmers consciously or unconsciously over lots of generations have been very much selected for their performance on the local soils, like the very sandy ones and everything else, and of course the climate as well. And I was just wondering, and I assume equally that the elite uh, strains that you, you, you were using to compare them with were selected in completely different sorts of conditions. Now, are the um, beer ones um, more sort of closely tied in with their local symbionts or more reliant on local symbionts? And are the um, elite cultivars more separated from that and more reliant on fertilizer inputs instead? Yeah, I mean, that's something we would really like to investigate. I mean, I, you know, looking at below ground is is such a difficult thing to try and understand, you know, and especially when you start to disturb the soil. Um, I mean, that is one thing that that um, so we have a Marie Curie fellow who's here for two years from the University of Copenhagen and her speciality is um, plant physiology and she she thinks it's it's more about the um, the mechanisms for transporting um, micronutrients throughout the plant that the bear are do better um, but it's I mean most of the elite lines would have been when when elite lines are trialed um, throughout you know the, there's very strict conditions in which they trial them under so you know the amount of nitrogen is is you know is is you know it's tr they're trialed under the best possible conditions to give you that maximum yield so it's very much likely that most of the elite lines are do don't rely on anything in the soil, any microbiota or um, any, you know, bacteria. I mean, there is work here at the James Hutton um, looking at some of the soil um, microbes and how they how they affect. And they have seen differences between the wild barley populations and um, elite lines. So there is there there must be something um, helping the bears and on the soil to um, you know to be able to grow that well under these conditions. Um farmers in Iceland previously just growing it for straw and now they're beginning to find they can get a bit of grain off it as well. So we all need to be thinking about adaptation for climate change. Mm -hmm. Now, um, other questions. Actually, Max has a couple of questions and it's probably better if I just hang, hand over to him to ask them because I'm sure he'll explain them better than I will. Over to you, Max. Thanks very much, Julia. Yeah, it was just um, uh, following up on a possible um, idea we have around growing for demonstration purposes for visitors to the garden this summer, various maybe more unfamiliar crop plants that would be uh, potentially more sustainable um, agriculture of the future, so less reliance on fertilizers and pesticides and, and so on. Um, and obviously the bear is a, is a great example potentially of this. So I was just curious to know if we were to grow it in the relatively kind of improved soils of the garden, we don't use lots of fertilizers, but we do add our own compost from the compost heaps. And I don't know whether some chicken manure, I, I think they're certainly growing organically, so they will be just using kind of um, natural fertilizers rather than things out of a, uh, a factory. But, um, you know, it, given that you've got a richer soil at the garden, if you were to grow the bear, 
how does it respond when it's got really nice conditions and um, you know uh, would it be um, growing too rapidly and falling over like some cereals do when they when they get too tall I'm just curious to know if you you've got any thoughts on what what it would do under better conditions yeah I mean we grow them I mean uh, uh, part of the trials we do down here as well and um, it does grow very tall and it does lodge um, it's a major issue for growing um, you know bear on the on good soils um, you know very fertile soils it's it's there's not really much you can do other than just not put anything on it <laughs> which you know so you can reduce the inputs quite substantially um, the problem is when we do these types of trials because we have you know we our, our farm puts um, you know the usual agronomic practices on it we do tend to find that the bears will grow um, very tall and it's one of the reasons why we want to kind of cross them with some of the elite lines, because if we can reduce that height, yet still have all the characteristics of the bear, um, it just means that, you know, and, and if they, you know, if they do use, um, if we can show that they they use the, in the micronutrients really efficiently, then, you know, it's a really nice extra crop that we can produce, you know, so it's it's got such nice advantages, it's it's well worth trying to work with. OK, thank you. Now we've had a whole rush of questions just come in. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody was waiting till the end in case you answered it. Um, OK, Hannah says, thank you for the lovely talk. I'm wondering how easy or hard is it to cross barley lines? Are they cleistogamous? Are land races and elite cultivars different in that respect? No, um, they are quite difficult. You do have to emasculate and you do have to um, and the timing of flowering is is quite difficult so it is they're not the easiest things to cross um but the the reason we like to use the land races is because they're they are quite they're much closer to um related to the elite lines so it makes it much easier to cross and um, but we do cross the wild barleys and again that's very much i mean the way we tend to do this is we'll grow um we'll grow We'll go tra trays of each of the cultivars we're interested so we'll grow them in 96 packs and we'll just we'll grow this we'll do this every week and we'll produce them so that you know if when they do come into flower and we can emasculate and we can get the pollen we can you know the timing is um is everything and also the time of year can be quite difficult to cross barley this coming into this time of year when it's starting to get a bit lighter is probably the best time to start crossing so we tend to do most of our crossing between now and um probably may although we i mean we we we, we have done it over the winter um but it's not it, you do need um you do need to be relatively well trained in order to do it and there's always a chance because it is a, an inbreeder it, there's always a chance that you've missed it and although you've tried you know that the pollen has already um, fertilized and so that you will get selfs coming through so it, it's always something to have to consider but um, it's, it's doable and people have been doing um, crossing for a long time with barley obviously all the breeders do this so okay okay thank you we have another question here from um, Alex Twyford, who asks, does historical geographic genetic structure in the land races reflect human migration routes? Um, I, it would kind of make sense. Um, you know, I mean, it's, this is something that would be really nice to study. I know that um, with some crops, things like um, I have a friend who works um, for the World Agroforestry Centre and he's looked at um, like trading in mangoes and how mangoes have moved and, and how the diversity that's been left um, relates to the trade routes. I mean, it would be really interesting to see if that is the case um, and whether as people moved that and that this was you, they left that signature on those individuals, on those on those barley plants in those regions. But I think it would kind of make sense that 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 you do see this, um, and you don't really see so much mixing of the land races, um, and they do tend to be. We did um, about the 1980s, late 80s. Um, there was a collection of um, material from Syria and Jordan, and. Um, Farmers have been growing uh, the land race barleys in those areas for a long time and the material coming out there was completely different from anything I'd ever seen yet, you know, and 
and farmers would, would swap seed, but really with very, very locally. Okay, that, that, that's interesting. Now we've got another question here on selection really, or tolerance. Um, John asks, uh, salt tolerance must be important on the West Coast. Thinking about some of those uh, windswept mm. coastal fields. Uh, can you identify genes for salt tolerance in these uh, land races? Yep, we, I mean, we've actually just, um, one of my colleagues has just published a paper um, um, probably about a couple of months ago, and she identified a gene that was involved in salt tolerance. Um, and she identified variants across the wild barleys as well as the land races. Um, so yes, we, we can identify them. We've never looked at them in the Scottish land races. We've mainly looked in material. I mean, our assumption, one of the, um, we have done some work with, in, um, with people in at Kaust in Saudi Arabia, um, where they where they irrigate, and if they can irrigate with, um, you know, the the, the water is very salty, and so of course, if they can irrigate, if they can understand salt tolerance, then they could probably use um, seawater as opposed to using, you know, valuable um, desalted de water. So so the understanding the whole salt tolerance thing is is really as and it's a complex trait. And so we've been we've been beginning to try and unravel that whole story. And um, again, it would open up a lot of marginal lands um, for growing cereals. I mean, our our work can you know a lot of the genes that you see in barley are also um, you you find in wheat. So you know we kind of work quite closely with the wheat community and 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 you know um, look for genes that they find and that we find and see if we can identify the same um, genes. OK, thank you. Now, looking at the rest of the questions, um, Leone asks, is there any work done on the nutritional status of any of the known varieties and the crop wild relatives? Yeah, I mean, um, barley is um, very high in beta-glucan um, and it's also high in anthocyanins. And um, you'll find that, um, I don't know if you could see from some of those pictures, but some of the barley grains are purple and we have black seeded gra um, grains as well. And these are particularly ones that um, have been used. We have a line called Tibet, um, which is, uh, as, it, as the name explains, comes from Tibet. And um, they mainly use their barley for, for feed, for human food. And so barley does have very much, a, a much more nutritional value than the likes of wheat. Um, and so it's up there with oats. And um, the problem we've got with barley is it's got the husk. Um, and so that is a, a bit of an issue um, in terms of um, processing the, the grain. So if if you could, we do also have naked barleys that don't have a husk. And so those are um, those are much better for feed, um, for human food and human consumption. However, they're not very easy to harvest because if you don't have your protective um, coat on your grain when you go through the combine it does tend to damage the embryo and um and so there's you know it's there's um we're we are trying to develop some new varieties with some of the companies um who who are interested in in barley grains for actually feed consumption and we do some work with the rowett um our colleagues at the rowett have done human uh, intervention studies on some of the bear lines because we think the bears um because they would have been used mainly for feed and for human food, we think those have the actual highest, some of the highest levels of beta-glucan um, and anthocyanins, as well as some of these coloured grains as well. Um, I shall read it out. Do you think that the adoption of gene editing techniques are likely to increase or decrease crop diversity? In other words, do you think that they're more likely to lead to a few widely adopted elite varieties or make land race diversity a more important, valuable, accessible resource? Yeah, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, I mean, the nice thing about gene editing is you can take a single gene from a land race and put it into an elite line. Um, I, I think I think it'll be more useful than it will be, um, and I don't really think that it will develop. Will develop these um, elite lines, which will only be, you know, um, very narrow. I think 
we still need to identify variation and and the only way to identify variation really is through um, understand is through natural diversity and I think most people agree that we you know that this is we've got so much variation in our in our natural resources that it just seems like it would it makes perfect sense and you know we've started to do some of this work experimental for research purposes and it's really nice because you can take a single gene so we can take the variation we see in some of these genes um, for like manganese and what we can do is we can take if we think we know we found the gene that's important and allows us to develop um, like and allow, you know allows a line to to survive and produce grain on very low um, um, soils, very low input soils and very poor soils. If we can, if you can introduce that gene using gene editing, um, when we grow them on, we can test those quite quickly on that soil. And if they do well, then we know that that's the gene we're interested in. And what we can do is we know that gene. So what we can do is we can go back into our gene bank. We can go back into all these 400,000 lines and we can search for variation in that gene and see what it does. So, you know, it's a, it's a nice complex at the moment. It's a it's it's a really good way of testing um, our candidate genes, genes that we are thinking involved and testing them quickly. Um, whether it becomes a technique that we use for actually um, improving culture, you know, improving lines or or tailoring lines for specific um, climates is another question. I mean, I think breeders will still always, um, you know, use use the techniques they've been using. And the main thing that speeds up breeding technologies is actually genetic markers, is being able to monitor these these genes that are important and through their selection process. Um, so I don't think we'll, you know, I don't think it will become, um, I mean, I think at the moment it's a very good research tool that we can use to test genes very quickly and, and easily, but, um, you know, we, methods of molecular breeding and um, looking at modelling of breeding and genomic selection, all sorts of different things that we can now do um, for breeders that w that really speed up the whole process of breeding. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> well, thank you, Joanne. Um, my, I've definitely got gremlins in my system. It's telling me I ought to sit closer to the router and it's already right next to me. So I think we perhaps better wrap this up for everybody. Uh, but that was that was really interesting. And, and it, it, in a way, it was particularly interesting to hear that this is such a wide collaborative project between so many different organisations, which enables you to exchange information and material and so on through so many different places. And um, it really sounds like a lifetime's research project or maybe you know 10 lifetimes or something <laughs> like that so anyway thank you very much and um, it that we'll have this lecture up on YouTube quite possibly with a few edits to cut out some of the um, gremlins it'll be up in a few days time um, so thank you everybody for coming and for staying with us for this meeting thank you thank you